This is the inaugural uh, presentation done by a healthcare provider. We've actually had in the past presentations by life sciences, we've had presentations by payers, but this is actually the first time that we're going to have uh, at, a, at inaugural healthcare provider who's going to be presenting. So it's, uh, it's a very exciting for us as well. And who we have on stage uh, today, uh, we have Michelle Hansen, uh, who's from Fairview Health. And then we also have uh, our global director of healthcare, uh, Dr. Yan Chow. So uh, I want to introduce those guys. Here's their information. And I'm going to turn it over to them. And then after this presentation, there's going to be a little chat, a little Q&A questions, and also a, a fireside chat. So thanks, guys. There we go. All right. Can you all hear me correctly? I'm a pretty loud person. So all right. All right. So transforming healthcare with innovation. So thank you. Thank you, Stell. Um, I'm excited to be here. and in person, especially from a healthcare perspective. I work remotely, I live in IT, and so this is also fun to see all the faces. Um, in person and share Fairview's enterprise digital transformation and the role of automation. For approximately the next 20 minutes, I will share information about our journey, our citizen developer program, why we chose to do a botathon, and our center of excellence. So a little bit about mHealth Fairview. It's a partnership of the University of Minnesota and Fairview Health Services. We are a large academic health system in Minnesota and a portion of Wisconsin. We, have a, we are a wonderful organization that focuses on community and our patients. When COVID first began, we stood up an entire hospital focused on COVID within weeks. So our team rallied around making sure that our community and our patients were safe, and we worked around the clock in order to do that. Our organization is on its journey to become digital to the core and transforming and enabling. These set of activities adopt strategy and structure to capture opportunities and enable digital tech. We will focus on automation here today. But I can tell you that we have, um, you call them pillars, you call them work streams, but we have everybody focused on each one of these areas in our organization today. So let me tell you about our automation journey. We started our automation journey in 2020. COVID, healthcare, not a good mix, right? So we started our journey a little slowly, but we had a lot of lessons learned. In 2022, we launched our Center of Excellence centralized team. That team is housed within IT, and we report to the chief digital officer. This year, we have stood up governance, and we've had our first botathon. As you can see, our roadmap However, we all know that our roadmaps change even just from this morning and listening to some of the new technology that's available. And so this is our current you know, roadmap, but I know it will change. The other thing is you have to look for that magic. Magic happens in our world when we have the right health system, technology partner, and system integrator all working together as a team. Automation Anywhere is our technology partner. Sidious Tech is our managed service partner. We utilize strategic sourcing in health, Fairview Health Services, which is a very unique proposition in the healthcare industry, but that is what we've done in order to see the magic happen for us. We don't have enough FTEs or can be able to scale up and scale back quickly. So as of right now, and I know into the future, it's going very well. So we all know that there's many, many steps that go into deploying automation. You can see our high level steps outlined here. One area that needs to be punctuated is testing. Testing, testing, testing. Um, testing needs care and attention. And as you'll see in our next use case, why we put so much emphasis in uh, testing. I keep wanting to point it over there. I'm going to point it. i got to remember to go back there. So 
Here's a use case example that is ripe for in every single organization. Supply chain purchase order acknowledgements. We built an automation to create and accept purchase orders. Um, the benefits were huge. Almost 1,965 hours of annual capacity generated for our supply chain. So that's labor hours given back to them. Not only that, it was also the quality that was also implemented with this use case. We had 12 different part-time people doing this process in the past where we were able to then take that one automation and pull it together and be able to do that work for them in a standardized manner. You heard me mention a little bit on the emphasis on testing. Well, one learning in this use case was testing. <laughs> When we did our requirements gathering, our, our line of business only gave us the happy path. Are you guys familiar with the happy path? If everything goes right, <laughs> this is how it will work. Well, when we got to the testing piece, not everything was going right. And we had very engaged business partners. What they said is, hmm, what happens if this happens? What happens when this errors out? And we went, you didn't, you didn't say that when we gathered the requirements. <laughs> so we quickly pulled together the team, gathered additional um, requirements, put together those additional use cases that were needed, and then went back to testing. Not only that, from a testing perspective, we also do, like I mentioned, those use cases, user acceptance testing, but we also do many layers of acceptance sign-off as well so that those users know that their responsibility in that use case going into production. I value those lines of business really speaking up at that time to tell us, hey, what about this? And so that we went into production with minimal issues going forward. Not only that, we also pulled that information back into our testing processes and our requirements gathering processes. And we now ask, is this just the happy path or do you have other scenarios that we should make sure we're gathering to make sure that we can build your automation appropriately? So our citizen developer program, we have been on our automation journey for a few years supporting it to a level that was pragmatic for us, honestly. The onboarding of automation outside of IT was low. If you remember me saying that we're housed inside of IT, well, it was seen as an IT asset or service rather than an enterprise asset or service. So we took a crowdsourcing approach. Let me talk a little bit about how we did that. So our citizen developer program, what we did is we took a small team of people, three, and we really emphasized these four pillars in building this out to be successful. We really wanted to build those processes, those standards, those repetitive um, items that need to be completed in order to be successful to deliver a successful automation and, an ex and um, a citizen developer that'll be successful as well. We also built a learning um, uh, training. Sorry, I'm going to pause there. So we also built training. So we took four days where we train citizen developers each and every month so that they understand those processes and those standards so that when they go to deploy those automations, they know the Fairview standards and security uh, processes that need to be in place before they deploy to production. We also implemented a research and optimization area. As we all heard, things change very quickly. And so how do we build that in a team that we can also think about how do we bring in that new technology quickly, evaluate it, and know from our perspective it's secure, our citizen developers can use it, we can teach it and roll it into our training platform. The other, the other and not least important, I would say the most important, is our citizen community and support. Each month we host a user group where we talk about um, those uh, use cases, what people have done, we show them what, what could be done for them. It's an area for them to actually connect and talk about um, the possibilities with automation. 
All right. So here is a typical path for our business to become citizen developers. Um, I would like to highlight that we host, or which I already did, is that four-day training to teach them about the tools and standards they must follow. The other piece of that is that we do not actually give them access to the tool until that day of training because anybody can sign up to be a citizen developer in our organization. We have them fill out a form. We then do a quick intake with them to understand, do they know those key concepts of becoming a citizen developer? If we believe that they will be fruitful in becoming a citizen developer, we move them on. If we feel that they have some low skills but really want to get started, we start them with Power Automate. I know I maybe shouldn't say that, but it's an easier tool for them to get used to and accustomed to to start. And once they build that competence, then we move them into um, Automation Anywhere or another tool. But it gives them the confidence and also not that we're just turning them away, we're giving them an option where they can be that enthusiastic and still want to learn and be a contributor to the organization and our automation program. The other piece that I will not underestimate is coaching and testing. So we talked about testing. The other piece is coaching and mentoring. My team does a lot of coaching and mentoring with our citizen developers. Once they, get their, once they go through class, the goal is that they put their, their automation in production within two weeks. So that means they get one-on-one -on -one time with a developer probably three to four times within that two weeks to help them get their automation to production. If you don't help them feel successful, they will stop. They will stop developing, they will stop thinking of those new opportunities. What we have learned is that you really need to help coach and guide them all the way through that process in order for them to reap the benefits and feel successful. So you may ask yourself, why do a botathon? Why was the citizen developer program not enough? We were having success with our citizen developer program. We were having people come to us and say, hey, I want to do this. Um, but there were some people that we were training that were just, hmm, maybe not the right fit. And there was also a, a mechanism that we needed to build going back to that community and building that peer network that we needed to focus on. And so that is why we did the Botathon. We really needed to connect those citizen developers to each other. The other thing is we wanted to make sure that we were also showing automation can be fun. So how can we make a game out of it? How can we put together a strategy that brings people together to learn together, to build relationships, and then also to have fun? And that was our answer, a Botathon. So, we had three teams participating in our Botathon. Here is the makeup of the teams. We had one mentor, which is a developer from our Center of Excellence team. We had three citizen developers that had already put something in production. And then I'm lucky enough to manage the summer college interns. So then I threw my summer college interns into the mix. And then they were the ones that really participated and asked the why. Why, is, why are we doing it this way? Why, why is automation so cool? So they were the ones that were really asking the questions as we were going through this process. Um, we also tried to, like I mentioned, try to make it fun. We also had three executive judges that came in at the last, last day for the last hour where these teams presented their opportunities um, to these executives, and they were the ones that chose the winner. Each team brainstormed opportunities, and uh, they all selected one to implement. One has already implemented their automation in production, and the other two will be going in in the next few weeks. So, Botathon successes. What did we get out of it? Did we reach our goal? Yeah. We had 15 new opportunities that came out of those few days that we spent together that equaled over 8,000 hours of labor if we were to implement all of them. We also 
um, we're able to work across 13 different departments, which brought 13 different unique ideas and opportunities together, and for people to work together that had not worked together in the past. One of the things that we didn't expect out of the Botathon, well, maybe we did, but we wanted to see if it would happen, <laughs> was they had a ton of fun. Just being with all of you here, meeting person to person, they met person to person. They interacted. Since COVID, we haven't done that a lot. So they got energized. They were able to really connect with one another. They have built peer relationships with one another. So now they go and ask each other questions rather than coming to the uh, Center of Excellence team, they go to them first. And if they have questions, they still come back to us. But that is really what we wanted to do. We wanted to build that community support and that peer network for them to really think about how do we implement this together as a team and ask those questions and really be able to put together that peer network. So what have been some of our overall automation successes? Well, we have over 100,000 hours of labor given back to our organization. We've implemented in six lines of business. We have over 80 citizen developers in our organization. 80. They, you know, as you talk about evangelizing automation, I have 80 people out there talking about automation with their leaders, with their managers, saying, can I do this? That's very powerful. That's where crowdsourcing comes in. That's how we leverage the momentum of automation. One of the success stories I'd like to highlight is around our COVID vaccination verification. Working in a healthcare organization when COVID first started, it was mandated that if you wanted to work in our healthcare facility, you needed to have your COVID vaccination. That immediately took many of our nurses out of giving care to actually look up and see who had been vaccinated and who hadn't. That is an extremely manual process to keep track of 40,000 employees to be able to know who had been vaccinated and who hadn't. Now that six is low, but we counted six. Within three weeks, I see Vince over there, I know he helped us, we were able to build an automation that went out and looked up every single employee's um, COVID vaccination and brought it back into our organization so that we can work more effectively. Not only that, when nursing staff was scarce, we were able to return those six FTEs back into the workforce. We ran that for, you know, it only ran for, I think, maybe six months, but it was well worth the effort of our three weeks of getting that into production and then managing it. So learnings on our journey. <laughs> One, standards. Making sure that you have standards, but not only that, making sure that your line of business has standards that they're working on and through every day. It's like a checklist, it's like a playbook. When we go start to work with our lines of business, the first question that we now ask them is, do you have a documented standard operating procedure? I know you guys know the answer, it's no. So then we have now partnered with our operational excellence team. So that's kind of our lean team within Fairview is that we say, okay, let us hand you off to this group of people so that you can get that documented. But as you're documenting, also think of the optimizations you want to do, because I know there's probably three or four at minimal ways that you're currently doing the process now land on that process and then we want to be, come back to you in about six weeks and have another conversation. The other thing is fail. My leadership gave us permission to fail. Fail fast and then iterate. It's not fail fast and leave it, it's fail, fail fast and iterate on it. So how do you make it better? How do you make it better fast? I think we're on our, about our 10th iteration of our citizen developer program. We started with six days of training. We went down to five days of training. We're now at four days of training. 
and you know my leaders are already like Michelle can you get that to three because you're taking people out I'm like yes we will try to do our best the other thing is if you're failing fast also on those use cases we've had many opportunities that have been brought to us that we've spent way too much time on when honestly um, healthcare, at least Fairview, it's very relationship-based. You want to please that line of business. You want to please your peer, right? You go back to your developers and go, ooh, what if we just write this Python script for this tiny little piece and I bet we can string it all together. And then we know it'll work. Is that the right thing to do? Nope, fail. Tell them no, it's okay. But how can we iterate on it? Engagement. I think I just told you about the power of the citizen developers. Engage the frontline employees. You really need to be able to go from that top down to bottom up. If you get their engagement and they understand what automation can do, that's very powerful. Those are those people that are in those use cases each and every day. If they're able to think about their daily work either as a citizen developer or a larger automation that the COE would run, they at least know what to look for because we're still in that state when we are engaging with new lines of business. Our next line of business is nursing. Very excited next year. But if you can think about how do you start to build that from those frontline employees that they can look into their daily work and be able to say, ooh, I got one. Help me do this. Pretty powerful. So what's next? One, we got to know our data. I'm not sure how all of you are doing it, but if you have any insights into how you're publishing your metrics and putting some dashboards together, boy, I think we're on our fifth iteration. Not that it's bad. We kind of good with the good, better, best model at Fairview. It's good, but we want to be great. So how do we become great? That's where, where we need to go. Gen AI, how do we get that put into, into place here at Fairview? Again, AI, healthcare, privacy, all of that, we're going through that right now. Total cost of ownership, really understanding the total cost of ownership. My team should not cost the organization anything. In fact, we're designing models that if we start to be able to give back to those lines of business, what are they giving back to me and my team so that I can build it to support it? So we're starting to put together those models now. Also, just transformation. How do we continue to transform? Think about it. How do we continue to not just stay in the norm, continually to move the dial? Our automation center of excellence. One, it's really about sharing knowledge, being collaborative, developing automation in an effective and standard way. I really, really emphasize that with my team. And then bringing people together to drive innovation, improvement, and collaboration. That's really what we are there for each and every day. And so to close from my presentation, then we'll move on to the fireside chat, is one, don't underestimate that frontline team member. How do you bring your messaging out to those people to then start to cultivate citizen developers, managing maybe your own botathon one, bot one day, and then about creating that community around automation? Thank you. All right, transition time. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle, that was great. Um, just a show of hands, how many of you are in healthcare systems where you have the freedom to fail? Oh, where are you guys? <laughs> 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 no, I think it's so important. I've done innovation for many years and... Uh, just a, is, am I okay? No, it was me. Oh. Okay. I've kind of loud. Um, we found, you know, I, was, I was at Kaiser for 32 years, and we found that the best way to, in terms of change management, to encourage people to innovate, was to have the successful people teach the people who are learning. That's the most effective by far. And the fact that you put your citizen developers through a formal training program, I wonder if that helps them to really have pride 
in becoming ambassadors for, for COE? What do you think? Oh, absolutely. I've got a little echo up here, so I'm not sure if I got two mics going or thanks. That helps. Um, yeah, I definitely think so. Because not only that, they are getting that hand holding for, for those four days. They're not only understanding, um, you know, really around the standards for automation, they're understanding our security standards. They're understanding our coding standards, our naming conventions. And so how can we help them be successful? The other piece is it's not just the training. We don't just train them and leave them. We then also make sure that they get that first automation in production. And so we go through a rigorous uh, code review before any of that goes into production. And that's really you know, a developer sitting side by side with them to ensure that they did learn everything. And so I do think that that, that is helpful. Do they, do they receive any um, sort of official recognition or is there pay tied to being a Ambassador? I will say not yet, mm -hmm. but I, I, I do see that coming here in the future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of like that old term, super user. Um, yeah, nobody likes that anymore. Um, but it, it's kind of tied to that super user. Um, but we want to be able to really kind of say ambassador, developer. Mm -hmm. You know, really what that person's looking for is that technology kind of um, assessment mm -hmm. and, making, and, and making sure that they know hey, I'm not just in it just to be able to say, oh, I'm an ambassador. Yeah. They really want to be known as I'm a leader in the organization and mm -hmm. I'm helping the organization move forward. Yeah, you mentioned that um, uh, clinical is coming. Mm -hmm. What's, uh, what do you think might happen there? How would you approach that? Yeah, I think it already is happening. So mm -hmm. Epic is our electronic medical record. Um, Epic has quite a few things coming down the road already. Um, but, you know, we are anxiously trying to break into, you know, automating with Epic. Um, I know there's a few hurdles we need to get through first in regards to what they will um, really partner with us to do. <laughs> I always see some smiles in the, in the audience. Um, but it'll be first, those few first cases will be really easy. It'll be more of those kind of those revenue cycle, mm -hmm. um, back office, maybe a test result that we need to inform somebody on. Um, and then I hope, hopefully it will get more and more um, mm -hmm. quick I would be, um, in order to get to production. Right, you know, it's interesting. Um, a lot of the metrics you're using are our say, which is the case for most of the healthcare organizations we deal with. Sometimes you get to actually hard savings, you know, mm. but I think when we all think about healthcare, we think about triple aim, quadruple aim. We think about quality of care. We're thinking about access to care. We're thinking about the patient experience. Do you think there's possibilities in those areas? Oh, absolutely, and we've already seen them. It's mm. just hard to qualify with metrics. Right. And how do you put that on a dashboard? Right. I think that's the one thing, you know, when we talk about know our data, how do you know your data? Mm. It's easy to track numbers, it's easy to track, you know, that ROI from a labor perspective, but when you start measuring quality, mm. how do you then do that follow-up to make sure that you did achieve those quality pieces that mm. you set out to achieve? It's not a one and done, it's a how do you set, um, how do you go back and set those markers to go back and check to make sure that you continually achieve that quality? Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the quality metrics actually are pretty traditional. You know, when you think about HEDIS or HCAPS, it's one of these things where they measure like how many people got their mammogram and you know, things like that. Whereas um, the interesting thing about AI is that you can actually look at a lot of metrics, even the metrics you didn't mention before, to detect multi-dimensional patterns that might correlate with better outcomes. You know, I think that's really intriguing, but it's very early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting, you know, the, the uh, whole idea of justifying automation in healthcare, and uh, we've talked to a lot of folks, how, how do you go about, you know, you have a new use case, how do you build a business case around it? Well, I think you can just, you know, leverage what we heard this morning, right? Mm -hmm is that there are gonna, the workforce is not increasing, is dwindling. And so how do we really put forth an understanding and how we can become a leader in healthcare 
to be able to take some of those pieces off of the plates of the people who are providing the care to provide better care. So that's the piece that I think we're focusing on, which is actually a very easy sell. We don't have mm -hmm. enough nurses. We don't have enough physicians. Mm -hmm. And so it is a very easy sell, I think, in healthcare. It's just leveraging which automations we should be doing in order to make the success that we need to, to give back to those areas that really do need to provide that critical care to our patients in our community. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the lessons you've learned? I mean, you mentioned a couple. Any other advice for people who want to build a COE, for instance? Well, one is our center of excellence. You know, we talked about the, the workforce. Well, Fairview did not have a huge workforce, and we do not have a large checkbook. We decided to be able to partner and be able to bring in a managed service partner with us to be able to leverage and get momentum mm -hmm. of somebody that had done it before. That is huge. Mm -hmm being able to partner with them, and then not only that, also partner with Automation Anywhere, who also has some huge successes, to be able to say, let's build some things and get some quick wins, but then let's build some great big things and show you on how we can do the great big workflows. I think one thing is that, you know, with healthcare is that, you know, we want to be able to, and any, any organization, but you want to be able to see the wins quickly. And so you got to find some of those things that have some really quick wins to show them this can be done and show them uh, not only your implementation metrics, but show them your support metrics as well. Ours are unbelievable. I think we have less than 2% downtime. Now we've done a lot. We've done a lot with standards and processes and monitoring. I will say there is one lesson learned. I just thought of something. We have a lot of spreadsheets at Fairview. I don't know about all of you, but we have a lot of spreadsheets that people just want to automate the heck out of, right? And so when we're automating those spreadsheets, one thing is when they check in that spreadsheet for that automation to run against, it has to be accurate. It has to be the same columns, the same format, and if they change a column, if they change anything, that automation breaks. So when we find something like that, Dr. Chow, that is a big lesson learned, is that we need to put more training on our business because it is a partnership. They thought, as we automated, we were gonna take over that process and that we owned it. No, we own the automation. You still own your process. You still own the content. So you need to be checking and validating that. We will do our work on the technical side. You do your work on the business side. The other thing is that some of our lines of business did not like the word bot. I don't know. So we call them digital colleagues. They are part of the team in our organization. Many of them have named them. So I got a ticket one day and said, Cody is broken. I'm like, who's Cody? And why is he broken? <laughs> and they said, oh no, that's our automation. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. And then I was quickly went to my team and said, do you know they named their bot Cody? And they, and they said, oh yeah, because he's part of the team. If he doesn't show up to work, right? He went down, he failed. Then they call him, hey, Cody didn't show up to work today. So I was like, okay, that's unique, but Boy, I'm not going to be able to remember all these names. <laughs> right, right. So Cody breaks, and then the manager of Cody needs therapy. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. um, I want to mention, a, we're coming to the close of a session, so I want to mention a couple of things about Gen AI, which we've seen in the market. Very exciting things right now. I know it's very early for Fairview it is. for most of us. But right now we're working with about, uh, I would say, three or four academic centers to who want to be the pioneers and thought leaders to understand what are the limits for Gen AI, what's the proper best practices, things like that, that actually is all still yet to be defined. So it's very interesting. We think about the use cases that we're seeing that people are doing are things like summarizing the record. That's a great use case for Gen AI, great use case, because you're putting in the data so there's no fabrication or hallucination. It comes back with the same data, hopefully, as long as you're not asking for citations. <laughs> okay. So you're using the data, and I've tried it. Uh, Gen AI is very good at prioritizing and summarizing. So you can imagine a patient going to see a new doctor. 
who is complicated, you know, patient's complicated, and the doctor has 10 minutes, right? That's the perfect use case. You look at it, one page, perfect summary. So that's one use case that's becoming very popular. The second one is something like email triage, mm -hmm. which I think is actually very difficult. Uh, email triage, you know, physicians, I think a study said they spend about two, three hours a night after they tuck the kids into bed <laughs> to work on the EHR, to work on the messaging. And that's burning everybody out, as you can imagine. So being able to look at an email and say, okay, this is important, this, I need to pay attention, or this one just gets redirected to so-and-so department or whatever, that's huge. And people, they love that. Uh, the patient uh, after visit summary, we have a demo on that. So feel free to reach out if you, you wanna see that. It's pretty impressive, it's on YouTube. So um, it's really interesting because now you can tailor the after visit summary to help patients comply and not be readmitted to the hospital by tailoring it to their language, their, their culture, their education level, their reading level. It's really pretty amazing uh, what you can do with that. So very exciting things coming. That, those are three out of probably hundreds of use cases that we could talk about. But we are now at um, a time when we do Q&A. So if you guys have questions, I invite you to participate, share your experience, it'll be wonderful. Remember, this is our inaugural session for healthcare <laughs> providers, so let's make it a good one. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Great presentation. Um, Sumit Punjabi, I also work in healthcare. Um, one of the interesting challenges that we've run into, as you know, healthcare operations is very seasonal. Like mm. health enrollment, volume spike up. Claims processing, there's a spike in volume. So we try to kick off the citizen developer program we got them interested initially, and then as workloads just start mm. spiking up, the interest levels dropped. And we were like two steps forward, but 10 steps behind constantly. Mm -hmm. We've now reached a point where we figured out it's easier to get the COE to drive a lot of these initiatives rather than focusing on citizen developer program. So in your experience, have you run into that challenge? And if so, how have you handled it? Yeah, um, daily. Um, but one of the things that we did is that we, we want to ensure that we are picking the right people for the citizen developer program. So that is one of the reasons why we implemented that intake session and be able to direct them to the right tool that fits them. So not only fits them technically, but fits with them in their job duty that they have time for. So that's one way. I think the other way is that coaching and mentoring. I'm very lucky to be able to scale a little bit with you know, my partner and be able to say, hey, should we like poke this person or poke this person? The other thing is um, I also talk with those citizen developers that if you're not gonna use your license, I'm going to take it away. Now, I've, it's very few cases that I've actually done that. But it does spur them on. So are you going to do this or are you not? I think, you know, as I mentioned, we also started in IT. So I have a lot of leadership, um, you know, really presence with us. And so it has become some of their goals in their organizations within IT that they have so many citizen developers. So not only am I talking with that citizen developer, I'm talking with their leader. So I'll say, hey, Joe says that he doesn't have time to automate anymore. Um, I'm looking to take his license away. Are you okay with that? Or would you like to have a conversation with Joe? So I do leverage that as well. The other um, thing I want to mention is that, and we found this to be true across industries, is when you do your first couple of automations, make sure there's a huge financial return or, or savings or something, because that's your proof point. <laughs> we, can, we can waive that. And that's so true in healthcare where, you know, people are not into long-term projects anywhere where the return comes in a year. They want the return in two months, you know, three months. So, anybody else? I think there's one over there. Yeah, so along with your citizen developers, I mean, we're also in healthcare, and when we build a lot of this, um, the business gets to depend on these automations. So you have all these people that are all over the place in different areas. How do you ensure that all your automations are running when they should? How do you, how do you monitor all those? That's a great question. You know, one of the things that we've implemented is that we look at that process design and really want to understand what it is that they're automating. So our team looks at every single process that that person would like that citizen developer 
person would like to implement. And we do that really weighing of, are they, talk, are they touching PHI? Are they touching credit card information? Are they touching personal, you know, personal information? If any of those three things a citizen developer is touching, that's an automatic no. Hmm. No, you're not gonna touch that data. That needs to come inside the CEO, COE, or maybe we shouldn't be doing that automation until we can really make sure that you, know, you have proven yourself to be safe and secure. One of the things that we do in our organization is ensure that safety and security around our automations, and we don't want to breach that. And so that's one thing that we do. I hope that answers the question. So when they run, they're supposed to. We do monitor them. However, when they're building their automations, it's more for themselves. And so what that we do is that we teach them from a change management perspective. They then need to put in an incident to have my team look at it, or if they can't fix it themselves, we will work with them. But it should not be that impactful of what they're building to the business. And that's why maybe I didn't say that uh, crisp enough before, is that we need to make sure we're reviewing that before it goes into production. If it's that impactful, it shouldn't live with the citizen developer. It needs to live in the COE or be monitored by the COE. Uh, from the automations that you have already in production, does any one of these automations has direct impact in the perception of the customers of the hospital in the benefit that they see they are having a better service, that they are speeding up the way they are uh, serve, uh, uh, doing the pre-registry, do, do you have examples on, on automations that are impacting directly the, the customers of the hospital? Yeah, so our volunteer services team um, was having a, a very hard time in regards to getting their volunteers onboarded. So here you have a person that's very excited to volunteer, give their time to your organization. And it took us five weeks to onboard them, you guys. It took us five weeks, and not only that, it took someone to really start to you know, follow up with them, make sure that they felt as a valued member of our organization. We built an automation end-to-end -end for that onboarding process that we are now able to not only just take an FTE out of doing that work and doing that follow-up, but also provide a better experience for that, on that volunteer that is volunteering their time to our organization. That's one example. There's a, there's a few others I could, I could highlight as well and happy to talk to you later about what those are. Questions? Hi, Regina Wheeler from Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, we have no bots, but we're in the process of building them. So. I love a lot of your ideas and what you've implemented. We'll uh, be thinking about that for sure. I was wondering how you handle bot maintenance and managing expectations of business process owners when their bots break. Yeah, that's a hard one. I think we had a couple bumps and bruises through that. So one of the things that we really do is really talk about how it's a partnership. This is now, you are now engaging in a partnership. And you talk a little bit about Cody. We're gonna make sure Cody shows up to work every day. You need to make sure Cody then delivers every day. And so those are some of those conversations that we've had with the business. In order to do that, that process design document, we make sure not only that the person that we're working with in that line of business signs off on that, we also have their leadership team sign off to say, yes, we wanna put this into production. We also talk about what does that mean so that means that you are now managing that data to make sure that it's accurate. You're validating that data. That is not something that the automation team can do. We can make sure that it runs, but we can't make sure that that output is still the desired output that you're looking to get. And we probably spend a good hour walking through that with them. We also then talk, we talk about standard operating procedures when we start the process. Well, the other piece around the standard operating procedures, we have them update it so that if the bot does not run, they know what to do. It's not an emergency call to IT to say, fix this. You have manual processes that you can go back to. So do you know what those are? So we have those conversations before the automation goes into production. And we also ask to see their updated standard operating procedure 
and that, you know, we ask that it's been trained, we can't verify that, to the rest of their team so that they know how to handle it when that automation does not run. But the other thing is, is we've had very low volume of automations not running. I'll be honest with you. We put monitoring in place, we have our team, we work extensively with IT. Um, one thing that you didn't see up here that I didn't talk to is that we also create um, uh, configuration items where we work in the CMDB of the service now. So when we create a uh, configuration item, we're able to identify, we register that automation, and we know what applications are associated with what automations. And so if an automation goes down, we are able to quickly look into that configuration item in our CMDB and ServiceNow and be able to identify what applications it touches and so that we could be able to see, then I talked to my IT partners, hey, did SailPoint have an issue today? Did Salesforce have an issue today? Because most often, it has not been our automations that have really caused the issue. It's been a different system that may, may be offline or not working. And then the other thing is, sorry, we also do a root cause analysis with them. Anytime that our automation goes down, we give them an explanation, and that builds confidence in us and them so that we can bridge that um, relationship. So we always do a root cause analysis when we do have something that does not um, get implemented on a timely manner. Hey, Michelle, how, how often do you revisit the uh, deliverables with the business units? I mean, you gotta keep doing it because you gotta keep asking them, like, is it still working for you, you know? So that's funny that you asked that, and I didn't even prompt you. <laughs> so we have an automation going into production that every six months it'll send a email to our business. Hey, because we've implemented that configuration item, we know how many incidents have been logged against mm -hmm. that, we know how many changes have been logged against that, we will, and we know how much uptime there's been. We will now send, we've created an automation, with automation anywhere, to be able to send them that email saying, hey, your automation has been, has this many incidents, these many changes, and it has run, and it has saved you this much you know, labor, that something we can count. Um, how's it going for you? Do you have any more automations that you'd like to talk to us about? Or, it also is a good way to, um, you know, healthcare, sometimes a little volatile, and so if that person has left, how would we make sure that we're also tracking with the right person in that team to make sure who's responsible of that automation? So that's going in about the next month. Mm -hmm. Just again, another touch point with the business so that they understand how their automation is working for them. So we are at the top of the hour. Flew by really fast. It did, um, I thought it was gonna, yeah. <laughs> so let's give Michelle a hand. and. Uh, and, and we'll be around for a couple of minutes. Thank you. Thank you. you.